Hi. I'm definitely the most overdressed person by far. But I'm from Delhi. Uh, it's our birthright to show up overdressed everywhere. So people don't judge us. You know, they just say she's from Delhi. So she's doing her duty. Thank you. Thank you for the very warm introduction. And uh, thank you to IIM Ahmedabad. I have a lot to be grateful to the red bricks for. On top of the list are, of course, the two best decisions of my life. Here's where I decided to become a founder back in 2007. And here's where I met my husband, my co-founder, and the father of my two wonderful children. And of course, there are a lot of other things that I attribute to I'm Ahmedabad, like learning to run here, uh, not talking about the marathon. I'm talking about the infamous WAC runs. For those who don't remember, uh, we had a course called WAC for which the submission time was 4 p.m. every month. And at 3.58 p.m. every month, I'd be seen sprinting from the old campus to the new campus so that I don't miss the 4 p.m. cutoff, like many other students. Uh, but I've heard that they've discontinued these WAC runs and it's boring online submission. So I'll not talk about that. I'm going to talk about another I'm and the Bud story. What would you do if you didn't have to worry about failing? Very powerful question, right? So I was 21 years old, studying, just joined IIM Ahmedabad in the first two, three months here on campus, when this question made me do something that I'd never done before. I decided to stand for the elections of the batch representative. I don't know if you still have that process now, but um, the batch representative was the person who was going to be representing the whole batch. And so I started my election campaigns, going door to door, um, asking my classmates for their precious vote, trying to read out my manifesto and trying to convince them about my leadership skills. It was very intense. You know, at business school, everything is intense. Even a talent night is intense. Uh, so an election campaign was very stressful and those were probably the longest days I had during my two years at IIM Ahmedabad. So I knew that for me this was going to be a life-changing opportunity. And well, it was. When the results came out, out of a batch of 260 boys and 40 girls, I had a total of Seven votes, <laughs> including mine. I started thinking that um, I probably have more than seven friends, but you know, there was no time to introspect that. I don't know what I accomplished out of those election campaigns. I think it was probably the most humiliating defeat in the history of IIM Ahmedabad. But I had other things to worry about at that time and not really time to think about my friendships because I had to figure out whether I was going to get my deposit back. You know, back in the day, they would disqualify candidates who had a shamefully low number of votes. So at the end of the day, all I wanted to do was to curl up under the desk and hide, hide from the whole campus, hide from myself and of course hide from my big, spectacular, very public failure. But the only thing I would want to get out and do was to kill whoever came up with this stupid question. What would you do if you didn't have to worry about failing? Like really, let's be clear, failing sucks. But then after a few months, I got over the embarrassment and the humiliation. I mostly realized that um, while that number, seven votes, was giving me nightmares and it still does, uh, most others in my class didn't seem to remember or care much about it. So in the second year, I decided to again contest in the elections, but this time for a very less, not such a hotly contested position. It was the head of the alumni cell and I actually won. And the, you know, this cell didn't have much to do. We just had to organize alumni reunions. But during those reunions, I met these alumni who were entrepreneurs. And that time, finding an educated entrepreneur was very rare. So some of these actually still date continue to be my mentors. And they continue to be my biggest cheerleaders. So I figured my formula for the next 14 years, for every goal, every big audacious goal that I had, 
I would have to go through X number of failures. Now that X was this wildly fluctuating hormonal variable. Because there were some times that it would shock me by actually being zero. Like in our second year at IIM Ahmedabad, a bunch of us, about six of us, decided to sign up for the Mumbai Marathon. It was a 42 kilometer race in Mumbai. And we had never really participated in any kind of a race before, except for the back runs, of course. And, you know, just by training for like three, four months, I managed to finish it and do it in five hours, get the medal. And so the X was actually zero that one time. And you know what happens, like one time the X is zero, it really confuses you, messes with your system, you start thinking you're invincible. But very luckily, entrepreneurship is the most humbling career in the world. So very soon I realized that this was the aberration and the X in my life is going to be a very large number, large number of failures and rejections before accomplishing anything. And in entrepreneurship, it was high, but in fundraising, it was the largest. 100 rejections before a deal, 100 different conversations where you get told, sorry, we can't invest in you before you get a deal. So this is actually a picture from 2013. And this is after one of those um, final round venture capital um, meetings. They are called these IC presentations, investment committee presentations. Now, you know, when I was sitting there, Yash was telling me, you are a PGP, you can do anything, go kill it in your presentation. Similarly, I used to think I've come from business school. One thing that I can crack is a good presentation, right? And the odds of failing after an investment committee round are actually very low. So after this, when we got a rejection, it was really hard hitting. And so I was like this for almost an hour as per my husband who clicked this picture. And well, while it looks ridiculous, I think you have to see that there's growth there. I went from curling up under desks to at least curling under a pillow. I think that's evolution, right? And to be fair, fundraising is hard for everybody. And less than 5% of the funding globally actually goes to women. So this was definitely a bit of an overreaction. But I've realized, again, that's me, can go through a million failures and a million rejections and even sometimes the harshest of criticism. But I do need to first do some drama and cry it out. Anyone else here? Give me a shout out. Raise your hand if you're like me. You need to cry it out, but you can deal with failures. I don't think I am the students have seen failure yet. Okay, good luck. Okay, there's one person there. Very good. And of course, uh, boys, I'm told they don't cry at all. But do try it. It's not too cool to cry. And, you know, crying it out sometimes helps you fail more often, which eventually helps you win more often. Anyway, so now that I had gotten used to failing more and getting over the failure quickly, quickly would be an overstatement, maybe quicker. I started thinking about, am I dreaming big enough? So when I was growing up, actually the biggest feminist in my life was my father. My father was so anguished by the amount of time he saw my adorable nani spend in making razor thin rotis and perfect meals every single day that he forbade me from entering the kitchen. And this wasn't in the form of a restriction, but was, was more in the form of a really random rhetoric that only a father who's determined to break stereotypes can come up with. Would you rather make the best and the freshest rotis in the world, or would you rather be the best in your field? Like, the sounds ridiculous, right? Well, it was, and as a result of years of having that rhetoric thrown at me, this is how I am somebody who's a parent who's more scared of parent-teacher meeting than her kids. Because every parent-teacher meeting, the teacher says, Ranveer's mom, this is the third year in a row he's got Maggie for potluck. And yes, I'm sorry, teacher, but um, what do you think of conflicts? Well, this is a joke, uh, but I do not know how to cook. And I am not proud of that because I think irrespective of gender, everybody should know how to cook. But I do get where my father was coming from because he was just trying to overcompensate for years of social conditioning and our own biological urge as women to do more. So six is to one is the ratio of the time 
that women spend in unpaid domestic chores compared to men right so for every one hour that a man is putting in women are putting in 6 hours in india and this is from the oecd report which says that it's not even linked to education so there is zero correlation to education here but the good news is that this number is of course improving we spoke to 85 women at sugar and they were all women who had domestic responsibilities and we realized that the younger women were spending about 2.8 hours at the end of a working day doing their domestic responsibilities where the older women were spending up to 4.9 hours. So that's a good sign because at the end of the day, all of us have 24 hours and a certain amount of physical and mental capacity. So I do feel that the biggest determinant of where the Indian GDP is going to go in the next decade is going to be how this ratio of 6 is to 1 evolves. And if it does go the right way, then I don't think fathers would have to use such extreme examples to push their daughters to be more ambitious. Because let's be clear, it's not that women are less ambitious than men. It's just that we're culturally growing up to not voice our ambitions. And you know, when we spoke to these 85 women, we realized that in an anonymous form, they spoke about being CXOs and founders and, you know, running large PLs. But, you know, in the interviews, these same women, when asked about their ambition, would use this one phrase over and over again. And that phrase was contributing to the organization meaningfully, whatever that means, right? Because, but, you know, that's our identity because we've grown up contributing. We're contributing at home, we're contributing at work, we're contributing to our children. And that's how we are. So 10 years ago, there was a very famous article that got circulated a lot amongst working women about can, why women still can't have it all. And then five years later evolved to women can have it all, but not at the same time. Now, I find this notion, which is binary of women having it all or not, very bizarre because I think each of us individually as men and women have a very different state of equilibrium that works for us, which is between our work, our family and play. The ratio that drives us, inspires us to be happy individuals is very different from each of us. So for me, I realized quite early on that this equilibrium involves, of course, having children who I'm very close to, but also being a runner, of course, also being a swimmer, being a cyclist and of course, being an entrepreneur. So my husband and I in 2017 did the Ironman uh, in Austria when we had a two-year-old son. And there are many days that I have taken my little ones to work. And, you know, of course, very embarrassing situations where the two-month-old would poop in the middle of an interview and the candidate would really wonder if that sensory assault, you know, the smell and the uh, sound was all part of the evaluation process. No, it wasn't. But this whole the idea of doing this wasn't really to prove that women can have it all because anybody who sees a woman with a little kid in office knows that she's struggling and it's not elegant at all. And it was not that my company really needed me to sh uh, shorten my maternity and show up there. They were actually happier to not have me there. It was because it was fun for me. I liked the action and that's why I wanted to do it and that fulfilled me and made me happy. But a byproduct of this was that there were a lot of women at Sugar who were on the fence about their post-maternity career choices and for them just having another example out of the hundreds of examples of what it's like to raise a family and have a career and do it all with imperfection help them question some of their preconceived notions. And then our senior designer Nutan who joined us four years ago uh, she got her little one-year-old uh, to our offsite you can see the little baby in red in the middle and now she is the role model for a lot of women at Sugar. So we have about 2,000 women at Sugar. And at somebody who employs more than 2,000 women, I feel it is up to me to not only ensure that they have an empowering place to work at, but also that they are able to figure out their equilibrium, their perfect equilibrium, whatever that may be. So figure out what works for you, what's that happy equilibrium for you, and go after it non-stop. I think this going with the flow, which I see a lot of women do, is highly overrated. The best outcomes I've seen come 
I have come from having very clear, decisive, bold choices about what we want our best version of our lives to be and then fighting hard for it. And sometimes our choices can be wrong, but as long as there are choices, I think we are fine. We don't have regrets there. We have regrets when we go with the flow. So still till date, only 25% of women are in formal employment. So we are the privileged lot, which is why it is upon us to also ask ourselves this question every single day. Am I paying forward more than I've been given? And I ask myself this question a lot because paying forward works. So they put three out of seven women in Shark Tank India in the decision making positions and almost 50% of the deals actually went to women founded companies. At least one woman, one co-founder was a woman. And this number is under 2% for India otherwise without this intervention. So I think the you know, these companies that are going to come out of it are going to become large businesses. They will employ a lot of women. These women will found other companies. I think this has a big cascading effect. And McKinsey's report says that even a 10% change in the number of working women can have a $700 billion impact on our GDP, GDP in the next decade. So I do feel that the next decade belongs to women, not because there is any lack of talent in men, of course not. But because women are the country's most underutilized asset. And when you make a small change there, it has an exponential impact. But as women in the workforce, while the changes outside of us will continue to be slow and we will not have too much control on them, it is important for us to ask ourselves these questions to have some control on our destiny, which is what would I do if I didn't have to worry about failing? Am I dreaming big enough? And am I lifting as I'm climbing? So I have been asking myself this question for the last decade. This is a picture of me in 2007 at Louis Khan Plaza at I'm Ahmedabad. I am today wearing the same top actually because I love how far I've come. Of course, fitter, happier and more inspired than ever to build India's largest beauty company and also in the process employ more than 10,000 women. And more importantly than that, to tell all the women I work with every single day to be brave, to be bold and to never ever apologize for being ambitious. Thank you.